Hello, and welcome to episode 21 of the PowerScore LSAT podcast. I am Dave Kalorn in Napa Valley. Yes, you are, and this is John Dinning in Los Angeles. John, how are things in Los Angeles today? Yeah, pretty good, man. Another sunny day in Beverly Hills that I can see through the window, stuck inside. You and everybody else, for the most part. Uh, I'm mostly stuck in traffic, but I take your point. <laughs> That's true across the world, to be honest. <laughs> Well, we've got an interesting topic today. We're going to focus on logic games, and we're going to talk about recognizing limited solution set games. And that topic is actually inspired, I think, uh, an inspired set of choices for uh, what we're drinking, what we're listening to. But let's go back to the beginning of where this topic came from. We knew we were going to talk about it at some point. And then about 10 days ago, Elon Musk, of all people, just sent out a tweet that was very simple. And all it said was, technically, alcohol is a solution, which I enjoyed because obviously he meant that in two senses. So I thought to myself, that's not an uncertain use of the term. He actually did that intentionally. So a little LSAT humor right there. But it made me start thinking about the idea of solutions and alcohol, obviously, being important to us. <laughs> Let's start with what you're drinking, then we'll go to what yeah. I'm drinking well, the and then first, talk about it more. The first step is admitting it. Uh, <laughs> it's funny that that Musk quote reminded me of one of my favorite Simpsons quotes, which is uh, Homer Simpson, where uh, it says something about like God bless alcohol, the cause of and solution to all of life's problems. And I just more thought that cause. was beautiful. More cause of more cause uh, of probably the solution, <laughs> or Elon Musk who thinks it's a solution as yeah, well. Yeah, Elon playing on the chemical and physical, which is uh, I appreciate. So in uh, I guess in a nod to that, we started, both of us, thinking a little bit about the idea of solutions in a chemistry sense, and it inspired my drink choice, which is a solution of scotch, as it were. And I'm using that word in both cases, too. Uh, specifically, I almost went with a very expensive bottle I had upstairs of Aberlour. It's 100 proof, so about 50% scotch, 50% water, ethanol versus water. But I opted for a cheaper version, in part because I'm not entirely clear on the definition of solution. Okay. Does it have to be equal parts? Can it be disequal? Does it have to be disequal parts? So instead, I grabbed a cheap bottle, as it were, of Laphroaig. Is Laphroaig cheap? Uh, it's 60 bucks, maybe. That doesn't sound cheap to me. Well, I think the Arbor is like 400 so... Hmm. Yeah. It's, it remains in its box. Uh, You'd have to pay me $400 to drink it. That might be worth it. Do I get to watch you drink it? <laughs> do I have to drink the whole bottle? Yes. For $400, no, you do. <laughs> it is sitting. Um, but Laphroaig, interestingly enough, is from, I think we've probably both visited where this is made in Scotland. Uh, it looks like it's pronounced Islay, but it's actually Isla, because Scots. Anyway, it's 86 proof, which means it's 43% ethanol. And I suppose the rest, mostly water. Water and dirt makes up, I think, the rest of this. Huh. Yeah. But that is my drink of choice. It is very peaty. It is very strong. It is not my favorite scotch. Somebody gave it to me. So if you hear me coughing up a storm. That's I don't like peaty. Probably is. Scotch. I don't yeah. like scotch anyway, but I certainly don't like the peaty version of it. So that's why I've chosen something that is also a solution, but is very different. And that yeah. would be a vodka cranberry. There you go. <laughs> That's the happy drink. It's got a nice color to it. It's got an, uh, enough sweetness that I'm happy, but it also has like that kind of like more stringent component to it, that yeah. sour aspect. And then, of course, vodka is beautiful because it doesn't have a taste. There you go. So, yeah, the solution side of this, of course, being on the chemistry end, the solute and solvent, the mix of the two. So let's actually talk about that because, mm. to be honest, when I was looking at this, from a chemistry standpoint, I was like, I really don't know what the definition of a solution is. So I looked it up. Yeah. And this is what the definition is. And I know there's a bunch of people right now who are like, oh my God, are we actually talking about chemistry solutions? Yes, we are. And it does have an LSAT point, I swear. <laughs> a bunch of people right now angrily typing in the comment section, <laughs> telling us we're wrong about this. Anyway, a solution is a mixture in which the minor component, the solute, is uniformly distributed within the major component, the solvent. 
And when I first read that, I thought to myself, man, I really hate chemistry and I'm glad I didn't study it beyond high school. So that was my first reaction because I never liked it. And then I started to think about how if you were like a professional chemist, you'd be like, that's ridiculous. That's really easy to understand. And part of it is because, you know, real chemists, they work with this stuff all the time. They're used to the terminology. And that obviously by analogy made me think about what we do with the LSAT. And how so many of the terms that we throw around, we're just used to it and we don't think twice about it because it is so commonplace for us. But then when students are coming into this world for the first time and they're taking the LSAT and beginning to study, it really is a huge challenge because just like I ran into the solute and the solvent and I was like, solvent, is there cleaners? What's going on? They're running into the same problems. And it's one of those moments where you think about the perspective on the issue and to me, I realize how much of it a struggle it is for most people when sure. they come in and all the different ideas, the terminology, the logic's actually difficult as well, of course. All these elements, just keep in mind that if you don't know anything about this, it's it's natural for it to feel this way. Right. Just as if I all of a sudden had to become an expert in chemistry, it would take me a while to kind of like spiral up until I was in the groove with this. So if you've just started out with this and you're like, boy, this is a challenge. Yeah it's built that way. And so it shouldn't be something that actually scares you or freaks you out or worries you. That is normal. Just take time and learn it. Just like I can now, you know, learn what a solution is and know the, the chemistry definition of it. You can figure out conditional reasoning or sure. causality or games or what have right, you. Right. When you say it's made that way, made to be difficult, you mean the test itself, of course, not the way we present things. That's correct. I know a lot of people coming in contact with words like contrapositive, which is a term we use, or, you know, a fixed distribution or an underfunded game. These are things that don't make intuitive sense right away for a lot of folks. Exactly. So you just have to learn like a chemist would what these words mean. And once you do and practice with them a little bit, they become part of your lexicon, part of your vernacular, and you're good to go. Yeah. yeah. Don't expect to walk in and be like, oh, this is simple. It's not. Right. Right. It is difficult, and any struggle that you're having is absolutely normal. So that's my feel-good message of the day, inspired no, it's a good by point. chemistry. That's a good so. point. It's, it's fluency 101. Now, with the idea of solutions in mind, we had to find a song that would bring all this together. And I believe that we have probably found the most perfect song in terms of like hitting all the notes. Right. We'll start off with the name of the song, which is Solution. Yes. <laughs> that was pretty simple. The band, an old classic hair metal band, is Tesla. Yeah. Now, of course, if you're thinking, you now can connect back our Elon Musk tweet to the fact that they make a Tesla. You know that he, what is he, the owner, president? I don't know what his actual role CEO. is. CEO. Yeah, oh, head, head badass. Yeah, uh, of Tesla. <laughs> Greatest liability cars. on Twitter, perhaps. <laughs> he's a he's a huge liability <laughs> himself. <laughs> Uh, and the uh, the SEC as well. Mm -hmm. But Tesla did a song from one of their later albums called Solution. And so we've wrapped up Solution. We've wrapped up Elon Musk. And if you like hard rock, Tesla is one of my favorite old school hard rock bands. Don't love this album so much, but this tune definitely jams. So that's kind of where we're at with alcohol, music, solutions, Elon Musk, all the good things in life. That's right. All the good things in life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. Got two of them at least. So far, so good. Yeah, you're not choking down Lafroy, so. God, no. Oh. See, you should drink a vodka cranberry and you'd be very happy. You'll be shocked to know I didn't have any cranberry juice on hand, David. <laughs> I don't understand why not. That's a staple for making drinks. Ugh. Anyway, let's move on to the news of the week. Not the Elsa Outworld news, but we've got another admission scandal that is just breaking. Uh, this is a brand new one, by the way. This is not the same as people paying schools and coaches yeah. to lie and get their kids in. This is not Varsity Blues. <laughs> this is one that I'll be interested to see how far it expands. It's coming out of Illinois, and apparently the Wall Street Journal and, and another publication have discovered that parents are giving up custody of their children, and they're doing that when the kids are in sophomore or junior level high school and they're doing it in order to kind of bypass the financial aid rules mm -hmm. so that the parent's income is not counted and instead the, the child can get need-based college financial aid. And I want to point out what I just said, which was the parents are giving 
of custody of their minor children. 16, 17-year-old kids, yeah. That blows my mind. And in many cases here, it looks like they were trying to get a $5,000 scholarship. So let me, let me put a point in this. They're, try, they're giving up custody of their child at 16 or 17 for $5,000. It looks that way to me. Now, there is a little more to it. There's a backside of this. It wasn't just that the kid is now on the streets or can do as he pleases. They did transfer guardianship, basically, to a friend or a family member or someone like that. Yeah. Somebody cl that they knew closely. So, right. it wasn't like, see you later, kid. Get out of the house. It was more <laughs> like, uh, you know, Uncle Johnny's going to help you out. Right. Uh, presumably, Uncle Johnny who makes less money or... Could it be, and in some cases I think it was, that the kid then is able to declare some type of financial independence, and yes. that then qualifies them. So I'm no longer, my parents are no longer my custodian. This person's my guardian, but I am financially independent. You have to count my income at 16. Right. And yeah. at that point, they're able to qualify for tuition aid and scholarships. And the investigation had uncovered about 50 examples of this in the past two years, just in this limited area, Lake County, and I think some of the other counties around it, which is north of Chicago, uh, includes some really affluent areas, including the area around Northwestern. And they don't know if there are more cases nationwide. It looks like it was started by somebody in that area, and then a law firm kind of kicked in with it. But I'll be interested to see how this goes forward. Man, really, another admission scandal? Well, let's, let's unpack it, because I know there's a sense of outrage here. I'll briefly unpack it. We don't need to dive too deep. Yeah. Um, in part because this is high school kids, and, well, we'll deal with them in about six years. Exactly. <laughs> but is this illegal? No. Is it unethical? Possibly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're trying to game a system that has allowed itself to be gamed. Yeah, you are completely gaming the system and with intent to circumvent, you know, clearly the spirit of what's going on. And in Illinois last year, you had 80,000 or so students who are eligible up for this particular grant that goes up to $5,000 that didn't get it because they ran out of money. So now you have these kids who are in some cases – the uh, the children of lawyers, doctors, you know, very typical white collar professional sure. uh, positions, they got it, but the kids who really needed it and were legitimately in line for it, they didn't get it because the grant is awarded on a first come first serve basis. Sure, don't you see this at least to some parallel degree as like those same wealthy parents hiring better accountants, finding extra loopholes in a tax system that allows them to pay less. It's sure. not illegal. Is it unethical? Uh, I mean, it goes against the spirit of it, but this is a where, do you, where do you draw the ethical line on something that hasn't been prohibited? Well, if you hire an accountant who says, look, we should position your assets in this way and that'll lower your tax bill, that's pretty normal. You're not doing anything where it's like you're really gyrating the system or torturing it into a new configuration. Interesting. These so, parents changed the normal course of what they would have done. They gave up their kids in order to get a few thousand dollars more, it appears, in certain instances. Yeah. I just have a deeper ethical problem with that. I thought you were just going to say I have a deeper sense of ethics. <laughs> <laughs> probably true probably as well. Probably also true. I wouldn't base <laughs> ethics on this in this case on frequency. In other words, accountants do this all the time. There's only 50 cases so far discovered of these parents. One is worse. Well, I mean, obviously, we work with accountants here at PowerScore. Sure. Uh, none of them has ever come to me and said, I need you to give up your child in order to create a better tax benefit. Now, if that were an available option. You know what my answer would be. Bye. So, <laughs> <laughs> see you, Cam. <laughs> Have fun with the neighbors. <laughs> no, that will not happen. Uh, I, don't, I wouldn't even joke about that with my wife because she would probably be like, no. Let's hope she doesn't listen to the first part. <laughs> she, I'll be if your she guardian. Listens, she'll know what my feelings are about this, yeah. which is absolutely send her, not. Send her down the coast. I'll take care of her. You can see her on holidays, Christmas. No, you okay. would not be my first choice for her guardian. So I hope she lives at home until she's 50 oh, anyway. I, say, I hope she likes Lefroy. Ah, oh, God. <laughs> Anyway, but, that's fascinating to me, regardless of where you position yourself in terms of right, wrong. It's really interesting. Well, you talk about side doors. 
back doors, front doors in terms of getting into these colleges. And this is obviously not about being admitted to the school, although the University of Illinois, which is definitely on top of this, has already started to take steps to withhold aid from the students that they have on campus that have done this while they investigate. But it is interesting to see another way that people, I mean, this is gaming the system no matter how you look at it. Yeah, no doubt about that. But it's a cash grab as opposed to an admissions grab. It's a cash grab, but it also this isn't cheap to do. You have to hire a law firm to go ahead and get that financial independence and then to go ahead and, and, and set that up for the student. You have to have money to make this happen. And, and once again, just like with Varsity Blues and all these celebrities, they had money mm-hmm. and they used it to manipulate the system. And I think we all know this is how this country and many other countries tend to work. But sometimes for me, this is not the kind of thing that I've ever – contemplated or even heard of other people contemplating. So it always blows my mind when I read something like this, I'm like, wow, somebody was really sketchy in terms of how they were approaching this. And it's really kind of like uh, backstreet stuff. It just does not, it doesn't feel clean to me. Yeah, this is very gray market. Anyway, let's move on to uh, something a little bit closer to home. Yeah. This week in the LSAT world, what's been going on? Well, I think the most immediate pressing thing to know about is the registration deadline for the September 21st LSAT is tomorrow night. It may be tonight, depending on when this comes out. The 1st of August at 11.59 uh, Eastern, p.m. Eastern. You have to register for September by then, or you just wait. So be yeah, mindful so of you, that. Yeah, it's coming If you right want up. to register for that September test, and you're listening to this today, you know, uh, on, August 1st, on August 1st, this is it. After that, you're going to be pushed into the, the next test. Right. But I know your opinion on this is that it wouldn't be such a bad thing to be pushed into the next test. Oh, gosh. I wouldn't even say I'm so 50-50. Uh, You're not a solution? <laughs> that, I am a solution. That's totally irrelevant there because it's not 50-50 on a solution. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm equal parts alcohol and exhausted. Are you the solute or the solvent? Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure what I am. <laughs> See, Just it gets pickled. tough. It does get pickled. <laughs> I, it does get tough. I am pickled. This is, um, I'll tell you why I have reservations about September in general. And people who are maybe on the fence right now, this might kick you to the October and November side of it. Um, first, if you paid any attention to what just happened in July or listened to our podcast about it in particular, you know that that was a far from smooth rollout of the tablets. Now, there were some paper issues as well, but the tablet issues in July were rampant. Um, I don't have a great deal of confidence that those are going to be fully resolved by September. I think it'll be better, but September's of all tablet test. If things go wrong, you don't have the contingencies built in. You don't get a free repeat. You don't get a score preview and a cancellation. Perhaps above all, it counts as one of your three attempts in the next year. So if you walk into a September test, your tablet's wonky. It has to be replaced three times or dies or freezes or whatever. Maybe tough luck. So when I look at September after the debacle, and I think that's a fair word, that was July, what I'm thinking about September is I'm going to sit this one out. I'm going to sit on the sidelines, observe this, get more information, and then know that they're going to work it out even further by the October test. And of course, October is still perfectly early in the admission cycle. It doesn't penalize you at all. That's my take on September. It would take a real urgency for me to actually sit for September knowing the risks. Yeah, I think one of the other issues about that July test that I had, has not been proven to have been fixed yet. I know where you're they going. Haven't had, they haven't had a chance, but is the stylus issue. Oh, it's not where I thought you were going. Yeah, I'm. well, that's because I had so many ways to choose <laughs> yeah, from. Yeah, that wasn't a lot of paths. <laughs> How many paths <laughs> to, uh, you know, peel the banana were oh, there? Oh, what a sad moment. Uh, yeah. I just... I have saw so many complaints, and I've actually received a number of messages post the July test that complained about, well, you know, the stylus didn't quite work the way I wanted it to, and so that changed my strategy for, say, reading comprehension. And I'm, I want them to increase the, the quality of the stylus, but we need to make sure that everybody gets a stylus, number one, and number two, that they work yeah. when they're actually doing this. You may not get a stylus, so this point could be moot. Yeah, exactly. So uh, You're supposed to, by the way. When we laugh about you may not get one, what we mean is LSAC just failed to send some to different centers. That's exactly right. Yeah. So that's a good point, too. Where I thought you were going to go with it was the nature of the July test construction being so strange. 
everyone getting an experimental LR section, them potentially using multiple versions of an LR section. And again, we had a post-July discussion of this, if you want to listen to it more. July was a weird test all around. So on the heels of a weird test, the last thing I want to do is sit for the very next version of it. I want to see what happens next and try to figure some stuff out. That's exactly right. So I... I can join you on this. Hey, if you have hesitation about September, there's no reason to rush into it right now. Yeah, that's a good way to put it, too. I'm not telling anyone sign up for September. Like, bail out, pull the cord. I'm more mean that if you're on the fence about it, you're not sure, and you don't have to take it, it's probably going to be a good one to just wait it out. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, of course, when we talk about waiting, one of the things that we can point out is is that it is about four weeks until those July LSAT scores come out. So we're looking at a good four-week delay here. Uh, and then, of course, it's not final. When those scores come out, you'll get the preview of the score right. that uh, you can actually go through. Yeah, and if you do cancel, you get a free repeat, a fee waiver that doesn't apply to September. Not retroactively, you can't sign up. So again, one more strike against September in my book. October will be free, though. So will November. Yeah. I, uh, I can get on board with that. So... The, other th- the only other thing that really happened this week in the LSAT world was that uh, they published another famous law, Colin Foley blog, which was about the 29th anniversary of the American Disabilities Act. And so they talked about uh, some of the things that they've been doing with that, and they went to a big conference, I believe, in Las Vegas. Uh, and I think it was sounds like it was a pretty good experience for them, and they got to show off the new tablet format. Right. And if accommodations is something that you need or have applied for, one of the things about this tablet is that it really does a lot in terms of being able to help out. You know, obviously, they can make the text bigger, they can separate the lines, they can change the uh, the contrast, the brightness, sure. these kinds of things. You can build so, an extra time right into the section, so the proctor is not your only hope. Yeah, it it really actually, one of the nice things about the tablet format is that it really appeals to and addresses a lot of issues that sure. were probably more difficult for them in the paper version. Well, it's way harder to customize paper than it is a digital set of text. Yeah. On the other hand, it's also kind of astonishing to me to realize it's only 29 years since the ADA was passed. It yeah, feels, I thought that it had been longer too. Yeah, it just feels like it's part of the, the fabric of... of you know, our society and and life here. So that was kind of interesting. When I saw 29th anniversary, I was like, it's not like the 59th. That does tell you sometimes how fast things get ingrained into the culture. That's right. And also how sometimes things haven't really been around that long. So kind of interesting. The belated nature of the obvious. Uh, That's a good way to put it right there. (laughs) That's a good turn of phrase. (laughs) Well, let's move on. Let's move to the actual LSAT stuff. And to talk a little bit about back to solutions again, yes. we're going to talk about limited solution set games. And typically some of the things that we talk about, which is identifying templates, identifying possibilities. And when we do our crystal ball seminars, we often talk about how you really have to look out for these types of games sure. because they are on so many LSATs. Most LSATs have at least one game that actually is best attacked using methods like this. And the method that I'm talking about is to show the basic templates or directions of the game, or in some cases, to show every possible outcome of the game. Uh, In other words, all the solutions. Mm -hmm. But one of the tough things is, is when you have games like that, how do you recognize them? Yeah. How do you know when to do it? Uh, We often talked about double-edged swords here, or I think you talked about a double-tip spear. I don't know. I say a lot of things. (laughs) I heard you reference that at some point, and I was like, (laughs) I don't understand it. But it's the type of technique that if you pull it out at the wrong time, it can hurt you. Of course, if you pull it out at the correct time, it is a dream approach to solving some of these games, especially certain very difficult games. And so you really want to make sure that you can knock it out of the park that way. Yeah, It's for both of those reasons, I think, this is so near and dear to our hearts, as it were. Um, yeah. It's dangerous and it's risky, which is, in a way, kind of fun. And it's also extremely powerful when employed in the right situation. I uh, I was thinking about this watching the Democratic debate. You'll see where I'm going with this. The other night, where Bernie's great line during the debate was someone was calling him out on not knowing something. And in classic Bernie fashion, I wrote the damn bill. Well, that's how I feel about templates and limited solution sets for us, in many ways, Dave. I feel like we kind of wrote the 
damn book on this. One of our most popular um, blog posts is me explaining how to identify templates. You obviously literally wrote the book in the Logic Games Bible where this gets explored. So this is an idea that has for a long time been very, um, I think, firmly ingrained, entrenched in how we view the test, how we approach it, and the types of advice that we give to people. Uh, so this is going to be a fun discussion. I'm looking forward to it. I will put one, if you'll indulge me one more minute, I will put one uh, slight disclaimer. That's probably the wrong word. That sounds like I'm pre-apologizing for something, and uh, we both know I only apologize the next morning. Instead, what I will say is, let me kind of preface this with the context of how we're going to run through these various constructions and ideas. When we talk about templates, certainly when I do with students, I really talk about a two-step process in employing them, committing to them. And the first is you have to have some type of limiting trigger. The game has got to have some factor or element in it that reduces it to a small number of channels or pathways forward. But that's not enough. That's insufficient to know templates are the right move. You're still in the danger zone at that point. I won't do the Archer quote, but you get it. The second part of this, <laughs> danger zone. The second part of this is there have to be outcomes, consequences to each of these limited factors or limiting factors. And if you don't have those consequences down the line, if the dominoes don't keep falling once you've tipped over the first couple that are there, then you really don't want to try to pursue this. It's dangerous. It's risky to go if these three paths at the start branch into 12 different positions. It's too much. We're going to mostly focus on the first half of that. We're going to focus on the things that when you recognize them, then you can start to think about the consequences, wonder about the outcomes, and if you see that they're limited as well, full speed ahead. Let's do some templates or show the possibilities. So with that in mind, you can tell, I think, where most of our emphasis will be. Yeah, it'll be on those initial elements. That's precisely right. Things that you would see in the game scenario or the rules that all of a sudden suggest, hmm, this might not be completely open-ended. Yeah. There might be some limiting elements here. And if that's the case, it should kind of like trigger this idea in your mind, like, I wonder if there's a limited number of solutions. And then you're looking at the other rules of the game and to see how they work, to see whether or not they further limit what could happen. That's right. Or or whether they just leave it completely open-ended and you're like, all right, it was a thought, but it didn't actually play out. I'll continue on as I would normally with my setup and then just doing the work for each problem as needed. Which is another great part of templates, frankly, is there's no game in the world that requires them in order to solve it. They're just an extremely powerful potential tool that makes your life a lot easier when they're available. Yeah. I'm actually a big fan of templates Me because... Too. I like the exploration process. If I see that there's several big directions in a game, sometimes the the value is in exploring those and learning certain things from that. And then what happens is you don't need to finish them. You don't need to show every single possibility because you just got enough information to help you go forward confidently. Now, if I felt like the remainder of the solutions were really close to me and I could probably finish them off quickly, that's probably when I'm going to show them. But sometimes what we do is we say, oh, I think I could show all the possibilities and discover that we can't. But in doing so, we showed a couple of basic templates and that really helped. And sure. that then allowed us to do the questions more quickly. Now, that double-edged sword idea, of course, comes in because it takes more time. Yeah, why are these dangerous? Perhaps we should address that point. Yeah, that's what I'm attempting to do right now. So, as, I, as I interrupt your attempt. <laughs> as you interrupt my, yeah. <laughs> my doing of that. All right, a scotch break. Uh, yeah, drink those little <laughs> Freud, man. Um, so when, when you take a look at it, what's happening is it takes time to actually show the templates and certainly even more time to show every possibility. And this is where the risk comes in. If it is the right time, then it's like a clean sword cutting through the problem mm -hmm. because you'll spend more time up front, but then you can do the questions much more quickly. The danger comes in if you are trying to show all the solutions in a game that has so many that you're going to run out of time. Yeah. So one of the questions that we get is, well, what's the maximum number of solutions that you draw out? There are games where there's nine solutions and the best approach is to show all nine solutions. In fact, it's the game about the, the flasks that just immediately jumped in, which of course is colored solutions that they're combining. Yeah. Solutions, man. Solutions. Everywhere today. Everywhere. Uh, yeah, I was thinking of Mulch Stone, although I think it only had eight. 
Yeah, but this is a good example. Eight, eight or nine doesn't scare us as long as we're able to control it. But what if you had 20 solutions in a game? That's going to take a long time to draw out and yeah. consider. That's too many. So usually what I think is three to four uh, templates is a pretty decent base. And then if they encompass, say, eight to ten uh, solutions, maybe I'll go and draw the rest of them out. It really depends on how I feel about what I'm looking at. How clear what you're seeing is in terms of those solutions. There are templates that would produce eight solutions, but you don't need to go any further. There are exactly. times when writing it out. It's all To me, this is just a giant cost-benefit analysis. There's always benefit to having templates. But at what cost? Exactly. But that's the double-edged sword that's right. scenario is do it at the right time. It takes a little time up front, but you get everything right and very quickly. Do it at the wrong time, you become mired in the setup and you spend too much time. So the ability to make that decision, that analytical choice of, I like what I'm seeing. It looks limited. Let's go through and, and show all these templates or possibilities. That's the key moment. That's what we're going to talk about is that initial trigger here. Yep. Perfect. Ready, ready to get into it? Yeah, let's talk about the first category. Yeah, we're going to break this down into broad categories and then very specific kind of… Uh, instances within the group. Instances, I yeah. like that. Yeah. Underneath. So, the, the first thing and maybe the biggest uh, kind of like or clue… Maybe most common perhaps? Yeah. Yeah. Numerical distribution. Mm-hmm. And I don't mean a one to one to one to one, et cetera. A numerical yeah, every distribution. game has a numerical distribution. <laughs> uh, they're mapping games that are… All right, all right. Not perfect that way, but even so, many of them do have that. And those games I'm thinking about are really from the 80s. So when you do get down to it, a numerical distribution, let's say there are three groups and each group has three members. That 333 three, three is a limiting factor right there. Or maybe it's 2, 2, and 1 right. are your groups. And maybe sometimes it's moving around and that maybe they're, they're saying there's a game that could be either three groups and they're either 2, 2, 2. Or three, two, and one. Maybe at that point, I'm going to show a template right. for the two, 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 and another one for the three, two, one. Depends upon the rules, but that's my first thought when I see something like that. Yeah, and we're going to reference certain games as we talk about this stuff. There have been a couple of games, partial template games, that are built on numerical distributions within the last couple of release tests. In fact, I won't yeah, go any it, further than than that. I won't spoil anything recent. I think what we're going to do is we talk about these games. We've largely chosen older games to reference because yeah. people are less familiar with those. It won't um, kind of compromise any recent tests that they might want to do. Sure. So not every single game is old, but almost all of them are. And then we'll put those in the notes for the podcast on the powerscore.com website. So if you want to go look at the game specifically, because we're not going to read the entire game or no. even do it. We're going to say, hey, this game was about this, and these were what the rules were. Yeah, but you can track all these down in those 10 actual books if you want to do it, or if you're one of our students, certainly you'll have access to this stuff too. So Exactly. So there are so many games that contain numerical distributions that it's not even, I think, a value for us to cite examples. No. There's, there's just tons of them. Mm -hmm. They're everywhere. Probably, I think, what is it, something like 30% of uh, the games out there that are best attacked with templates, solutions or, yeah. Yeah, or templates are based upon numerical distribution kind of uncertainties yeah. that you would look at. Well, here's to me one way to demonstrate the power of numerical distributions themselves is you mentioned the crystal ball webinars that we do. The two big features in games that we talk about, numerical distributions and templates. So... Clearly, this is a point of emphasis, and they often overlap. Yeah, and they're, they're more advanced, too. That's right. You know, we tell people in those seminars, oh, linear games, grouping games. That stuff's basic to me. But when we start talking about distributions and then showing limited solutions, that's the more advanced stuff. That's yeah. where LSAC expects that some people won't know how to do it. So you get an advantage by understanding that concept. Agreed. Yeah, and you have to learn the terminology here, just like solute and solvent. I, I was just thinking the same thing. If you're an amateur LSAT <laughs> chemist out there, and we're throwing around words like linear and grouping, you'll learn what all of that means. That's exactly They're right. fundamental. Yeah, it'll, it's coming down the pipeline. All right, so the first one, numerical distribution. And this is all yep. under the category of numerical limitations in the game. Perfect. The next one is either there's a small number of variables in total, or there's only a small number of available spaces within the given uh, overall total. Right. So the first one being a small group to distribute, and the second being a small number of places to distribute them. 
Yeah. That's, so if you have you a mean? game that only has five variables, there's fewer configurations of that than a game that has eight variables. So right away, it is numerically limited. Yeah. Does having five variables mean that, okay, I'm going to actually show all the solutions? No. No. It doesn't, but it makes it more likely that a game might be best attacked with that. Yeah, especially if those variables don't get repeated or used more than once. If that's all you're going to use is those five, that's an extremely limited set. And of course, four more so, and on occasion, three. Yeah, and the second part of this is, or if there's a small number of available spaces. One of the games I'm going to cite in just a few minutes starts off with six variables. They place two of the variables. And so what you really have in that game is four open spaces and four variables for that. Four moving parts, which is pretty easy to track and pretty limited in its outcomes. Yeah, there's not many different ways to put those four together. 24 ways. And so consequently, nice math, uh, it it suggests to me maybe there's a way to do this that involves templates or or possibilities. But I'll mention that game shortly because it actually figures in a fair number of these points of discussion. Now, there is a fairly recent game that kind of fits this parameter that we're talking about. And I'm not going to read it because I don't want to create a situation where it's like, oh, man, I haven't taken that test. But the scenario is basic enough that I'll just kind of change it. And what it comes (laughs) down to is the rules say something like this. Uh, A person must determine the order of five events. And they're going to be aired consecutively. So there's five events in a row. And then one of the rules says that two of the events, X and Y, and I'm just making up these variables, must be aired consecutively. Now, right away, you've got a block inside a game with five, just five spaces. Mm -hmm. That block, irrespective of any other rule, has only four positions. It can either be in spaces one and two, spaces two and three, spaces three and four, or spaces four and five. So right away, you have four basic templates in that game. But of course, they're not done. There's another rule that says something to the effect that X must be ahead of, I'll say, T. (laughs) Well, that means that block can't be down in four and five. So now it's just one, two, two, three, or three and four. And now you're really in a position where you think to yourself, I might be in good shape if I just showed these three basic directions. Yeah. Because there's other rules as well. Right. Now, notice what's happened as you went from just this single rule, which had those four positions, this sliding block, to an additional rule that limited to three spots and placed one of your three remaining variables, or at least started to move it around. If it's in three, four, the T's in five. I think you used a T. Uh, That's what we mean by consequences. If it was just a block that can go four places and you didn't know anything else, I wouldn't start to show that. I wouldn't. I don't think that's a template moment. But if that block does stuff, or gets limited to three spots and the other variables are impacted, then suddenly the consequences probably make it worthwhile. That's where, to me, the scales tip. Yeah, and this is what I would say. In a game like this, where that block exists and there's only four possible placements, you know there's going to be other rules that affect the other variables. So it becomes extremely likely that you end up showing that type of scenario. Blocks by themselves are really helpful in limiting the outcomes because you have to account for them. In a game with only five spaces, a block becomes immensely powerful. You should focus on that block and think, I've got to take care of that first because it always is occupying these spaces. That, That game was just a great confluence of a number of factors. You've got a block, you've got a limited linear base, so the block can just slide and you've got other rules obviously tied to the block. That to me is, yeah, that's gold. But it's a great example of what we're talking about, small number of variables or a small number of available spaces. Mm -hmm. Think about it. Have it cross your mind to see whether or not you should show a certain number of templates or possibilities. All right. How about this one? A scenario that creates multiple groups and then leaves only one or two spaces available in one or more of the groups. You're going to probably want to clarify that a little bit because that was a mouthful. It is a mouthful. (laughs) (laughs) So let's say you have a game that uh, we'll use a fairly normal example, a three, three, and three grouping configuration. So they go ahead and they open it up. So it looks like, all right, nine into nine, for example, Mm -hmm. three spaces is a lot to work with. But let's all of a sudden say that in the third group, 
they assign variables to two of the three spaces. All of a sudden, what you're working with at that point is a situation where that single space in that third group is incredibly limited and probably has a controlling impact on what happens with the other variables. I'm not saying it's completely controlling, but it will have a huge impact on what actually occurs. It and will fill be, that group, though. Yeah. yeah. And as you, soon as you close it. And there'll probably be some limitation on who can go in that group. There'll be a block, for example, in that game that won't be able to fit in that group. And all of a sudden, you'll start to see these additional consequential limitations that we actually have. Yeah, that's a great example, again, of a small number of available spaces, both in terms of group one, two, or three. There's only three spots to put things. And in terms of three positions in each group, both of those are narrow. It may feel like nine variables is a ton of things, but the selection spots or the placement spots are limited. This, I don't know about you, Dave, but this has been one of the biggest talking points for me, one of like the highest ticket items on recent tests. I see this over and over and over. Yeah. They've been doing a lot of this. Mm -hmm. But I also think about it as like these microclimates inside of a game. Like you just said, <laughs> nine variables into nine spaces. And that's, that's a big global scenario. And you're yeah. like, ah, that's so much. And then all of a sudden you're like, but group three only has one space. And that microclimate there, all of a sudden it's like, hmm, I can really have a big impact on that. Sure. And I need to take special care of what's going on there. So, yeah, I'm constantly aware of both of those sides of things. I'm always looking like, where's the narrowest input? Or where's the narrowest reception point? Agreed. Yeah. Best way to do it. Let's move on to the next of the numerical limitations. Sure. I like this one a lot. You kind of referenced this a little bit before. Um, this is the idea where a game may have a number of variables, but as it starts to put them in place or fix them, it may leave only a few that are free to move. The example you used before, I think, was six into six, but two get fixed in place. Exactly. Yeah. Which, again, that game's coming up. We're going to talk about it. It's, it's the famous golf tennis game yeah. uh, from a while back. So we'll actually read part of that and uh, examine it momentarily. It's a great game to understand for this idea, for sure. Yeah, it really is. But again, if, if you have nine variables, but they fix three or four of them in some way, you're not looking at a nine variable game any longer. You've really reduced the scope of what you're looking at. Precisely. But each of these first four items have, have really been built around uh, a direct numerical limitation idea. And we can kind of keep on with that theme because sure. really the next big segment of what we talk about is built around duality when there's really only two options. And I'll throw another one in here, although we won't talk about it as much, and that is triality. Right. In logic games, the power of two and the power of three is immense. So many games that are built around limited solutions have some aspect that focuses on two or three. It might be three spaces. It might be a group of three variables where only two are being chosen. It could be a variable that only has two positions. Right. We're going to talk about some of these examples here, but think about that power of two and power of three because they are so often at the heart of a limited solution set uh, game scenario. Yeah, and look, even if they don't produce templates or limited solutions, it's still valuable to catch. It's still going to be an, an important idea, or central point around which the rest of the game often resolves. So if you could figure out, for instance, that only two things could go first, I'm thinking of the infamous computer virus game, for instance. Okay. There were no templates really to draw in that game. You could, but you didn't have to attack it that way, and a lot of people didn't. But if you could spot that first position as a dual point, then instantly you were on your way. That was a huge inference to make. That was what broke the game wide open for me. I didn't see it right away. It took me looking at the questions to catch it. Yeah. you. It's not the most obvious thing, but that game was also a struggle to figure out where do you start. Yeah. No but kidding. you start with the first one. And if you can get to that point of understanding that it's a chain and it's hard to figure out the end of the chain without knowing the beginning of the chain, right. then it makes it a lot easier. For sure. It was the second question, by the way, that talked about which the font could be first. With five answers, you're going to get rid of four. You're only left with two. So you got a point and a massive inference in that game. I didn't do templates for it, but that inference with duality was huge. Yeah, well, when you see a question like that, a lot of times a global question can give you a good sense of, oh, wait a second, a bunch of these can't be. That's right. And then you're able to kind of lock in, mm, if that's the case, there's only a few that could be. Perfect. And kind of take it from there. 
So starting off with the idea of duality, one of my favorites, talking about two value systems. And John and I were talking about this before the podcast, where not every game with a two value system, and I'm going to define it in a second, sure. is a game that has limited solutions. But it's one of those things that when it does come up, it really is a powerful limiting force. Right. And what it means is, is that there are two groups and all the variables must be in one or, or the other group. So that's typically how I define it. Or if you are selecting from a larger set of variables, once you have the remaining variables, they're all in there. So if you had nine into six, once you take those three out, those six have to go in one of the two groups. And so if they're not in one, they're in the other and, and vice versa. So that's the classic two value scenario. I typically think of it as the, the former where it's like six into six and it's two groups of three. Or eight into eight, and it's two groups of four. It doesn't have to be two groups of four. It could be a group of five and a group of three. But the game that we keep talking about here is actually from Prep Test 25. And it is a game about golf and tennis. And they have six people that are playing one of two sports, golf or tennis. And you have to play one of the two. So that's pretty helpful uh, right there. The first two rules in that game go ahead and they throw one of the players into tennis and one of the players into golf. So all of a sudden, you're now four players going into those two groups. Right. It is really limited. But it's actually the rest of the rules that end up limiting this game beyond that. There's a whole bunch of conditional rules. And in two value systems, what you often have is you have a situation where conditional rules have a really big role because... If you have a negative, for example, if you say if A is in group one, B is not in group two, well, if A and B are both being used, when it says B is not in group two, that forces B back into group one. So in a two-value system, not being in one of the groups forces you into the other group. Right. It's binary the condition, power. right? Yeah. Um, let me, before you move on, let me actually make a point that's bugging me uh, about a, an idea that you introduced earlier. I think if you get hung up on duality to the point where every time you see an either-or situation in a game, you seize upon it and think it's going to give you something, you're going to lose your mind. You're going to spiral and really struggle with this stuff. The reason being, almost every game in existence has some point of either-or. At some point, almost every game is going to create a situation where if this doesn't happen, this will. Or this can only go in two positions. Or this spot can only be filled by two things. Every conditional rule you see is a dual condition. Either the first sufficient happens and the necessary follows, or the necessary doesn't occur and the sufficient fails to as well. It's just contrapositives. So again, if what you're thinking we mean by duality is, oh, I see a split, or oh, I see that you know S can go first or seventh, stop. That is not necessarily going to be a life-changing moment in that game. The rest has to matter maybe that's Although, a little bit much but we're about to talk about that right <laughs> almost that exact type of rule no but your your point is well taken it's it, it actually is um analogous to the idea of conditionality sure. conditionality is everywhere on this test if you get overly fixated on it you lose your mind because <laughs> it's in all sorts of logical reasoning questions. It's all over logic games. You could see conditionality everywhere if you choose to. Yeah. The key is not seeing conditionality everywhere. The key is seeing it when it's important. In the same way... When it controls the, the rest of the consequences, the rest of the variables, yes. Yeah, and the, and the key thing here is not thinking, oh, it's two options, so automatically I'm doing this, but rather, does that limit things sufficiently not to confuse the conversation, sufficiently that I might want to explore the idea of having fewer things actually happen. And a two-value system where all the variables are in one group or another, and once you know who's in play, that actually is incredibly limiting in terms of what, actu what happens. And so that's why we bring it up. There's another game, too, that's a little bit later. It's from Prep Test 34, and it's about six doctors. And there's once again, six of them, and they're at one of two clinics, mm -hmm. Suterton or Ransboro. And all the rules 
come down and they're all conditional. In fact, you've got five separate conditional rules. And when I look at something like that and I'm like, six isn't a huge number of variables, two groups, boy, you're really limited and all that conditional stuff, I now can get a good sense that when variables are at one spot, it's going to start pushing the other variables around. And since they don't have many options, they either get forced into one group or the other. Yeah. So really the duality that you've introduced in these two game examples is overarching duality. In other words, the places you can assign people are dual options. They're either at Suderton or Ransboro, two clinics, and that's the only places you can put people. They either play golf or tennis, and that's the only things you can assign people to. Um, I'm talking more about the duality that would exist, again, in a rule like S is first or seventh. Or so let's talk that about that. Yeah. Because that actually is – those things are triggers in and of themselves, too. They don't have to always trigger it. Sure. Dual groups, I think, is a much more powerful Hugely construction powerful. than a rule itself that just is dual to a variable or even a dual position. True. But think about it That's this way. I mean. The, the, the positions or the rules, and I see them separately, or the variables or the positions. If you have a rule that says something like R must be first or third, that to me could send you in the direction of two templates, one where R is first, one where R is third. For sure. But it's going to take an know. awful lot on the back end for that to occur. Yeah. That rule by itself won't. Just as if you say um, there is a space that only has one of two variables, either R or S must be second. Yeah. Okay, now I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, all right, that's a totally different type of rule, but it is also limiting in its way because every time I create a solution, that space has to be one of those two variables and yeah. that knocks out everybody else. Yeah, so, I guess I'm just kind of leaning into the cautionary side of this because I see people get so enamored with the idea of templates. They do a game, they see the templates, it works out, and they're like, oh my God, that was amazing. And then every time they see anything that splits a game into two channels, they want to chase them both. Like R and 1, R and 3. Well, that better both have some consequences. Otherwise, writing two templates out, all you've done is waste time, create two diagrams for nothing. Well, you know what I would suggest then? If that's, I mean, what I would probably tell someone who's like, I love this. I want to do it all the time. I'd be like, go ahead and do it all the time for a little bit. <laughs> Not to be mean. No. Uh, but as a learning exercise, I'd be sure. like, do it. Take the next test and do all four games this way. Let's see what happens. If you're lucky, you might get three games that it actually applies to. But on that fourth game, you'll quickly understand that you are destroying yourself. Yeah. And that type of lesson is very visceral when it happens to you. And you're like, I made a mistake. I should not have shown all the solutions. I've learned my lesson. And so sometimes it's okay to do that. That's right. And I just, I love your like old school, tough love parenting. That's what that is. <laughs> yeah. Stick your hand in the fire. You won't do it again. Sometimes it's better to have <laughs> someone experience it themselves as opposed to listening to me drone on. No, I've got it. a very vivid memory as a kid sticking a, a nail in a socket. And my dad hovering over me, just watching me do it with his arms crossed. And I did it. Sounds dangerous to me. I did it. And bam. And I wailed. And he goes, you won't do that again, will you? I was like, you asshole. But he was, he was right. <laughs> uh, knowing your father, I could see him doing that. Yep. He stifled, He's a good guy. stifled a laugh. We've had drinks before and, and I yeah. find him to be entertaining. He poured some Lefroy. He might have been drinking Lefroy. I been. certainly wasn't. <laughs> but he doesn't give me grief about drinking a vodka cranberry or shots of fireball. or Not to your face. So. Not to your face. That's okay. I don't mind being made fun of behind my back. That's the best way to do it. <laughs> for you guys. <laughs> it's the safest way for me. Anyway. But anyway, those two games I think are really good illustrations of what we mean by duality. It's not every time a game splits off of a single instance. It's really a more controlling factor. Yeah. I mean, like one of the examples that we had looked at where we talk about the variables having like a limited number of positions was a game from Prep Test 41. And it's the game about hangers in a closet. And one of the rules is the rayon dress is on hanger one or hanger six. That by itself doesn't make me go show the game in a template scenario. But when I start looking at some of the other things and I can see how the endpoints will affect those, I then start to think maybe I should show this Perfect. and yeah. show some templates or show possibilities as the case may be. Yeah. There's plenty of examples where those rules have a really big effect. But I think maybe not as much as the initial one that we talked about with the two value system where it's like global, you're yeah. in one or the other. Yeah. And perhaps not as much as the last example of this duality that we'll talk about, which I think is probably one of your 
more favorite ones, and that's the idea of splitting a linear game in half. Mm, yeah, I do love when this happens, because it happens a lot. It does. Um, and there are, again, numerous instances of this occurring. I don't want to waste a test for anybody, but um, there was a test from, I can say this, I think, 2018 that was a great example of an odd-numbered base, so a three, five, seven type of base, where they put something right in that middle spot, and it splits the game in two. I believe that's what you're referring to. I am, in general, although we have an older example, too. Yeah, there's a, an example we'll actually give you, but if you're looking for this in recent tests, it's happening still. Meaning that, let's say you have nine spaces. All right, so this is not specific to any of the games that we're right. talking about. Really big. You put a variable in position five and you fix it there, or one of two variables. You now have created the first four spaces as a little mini game, and then the last four spaces as a second mini game. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, we now have those microclimates that I was talking about before. I'm stealing that phrase, by the way. I've never heard you say that, but I like it. Do you realize it's a wine term? Oh, well, yeah. no, I did not. Uh, and now I mean, I'm familiar with it just in terms of meteorology, but like, I didn't know yeah. that it was... Oh, they talk about it constantly, about yeah. the microclimate of this area versus the microclimate of something 100 yards away and how it changes the nature of the wine. Makes sense. It yeah. does, especially when you walk through the vineyards and you see that some grapes have fared much differently, even though they're quite close together. Hmm. Anyway, but it creates these two sub-games, these microclimates, as it were. Now, in a game with nine variables, those are two pretty big games still. Sure. If you have a game with five variables and you put one in the center, you yeah. now have real limitations. And guess what? If you decide to add a block at some point, which so often happens, all of a sudden that block is now really powerful and is pushing other variables around in each one of those little mini games that you're dealing with. Yeah. So I'm always on the lookout for that. If I see five spaces or seven, if they do something in three or what would be four, I guess, respectively. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's use the example from Do it. Prep Test 34. Perfect. So this is a game about seven trains uh, arriving at a station in order. And one of the rules says that either the York or the Worcester <laughs> arrives fourth is the name of the train, the Worcester. Uh, so at that point, you've got seven spaces. You put one of two variables in the fourth position. You've created a micro game from spaces one, two, and three, and now you've created a second micro game with spaces five, six, seven. Mm -hmm. So at that particular point, you now have these two sub games that you're actually dealing with, and they're built around what's happening in the middle. And of course, there's then a bunch of additional rules yeah. that limit what occurs with all the other variables. Yeah. One thing in that game in particular that I remember caught my eye the first time I looked at it was you had that split in four of Y and W, which separated the game, as you say, and the very next rule had both Y and W in it, which means who you put into four was potentially going to control more things immediately. Specifically, it was going to control S. Yeah. So wh whoever's there, if you decide in a template you're putting W there, it pushes S into one of the two positions in the sub-games. And, and it pushed Y around, y. too, because Y, yep. again, was part of this sequence in the next rule. So that's what we mean by consequences, additional outcomes that occur. One of the easiest ways to do it, and we'll talk about this more in the future, too, is when variables overlap or duplicate, when there's connections. Yeah. So that kind of like splitting of the linear scenario into two equal pieces, very powerful thing that they do. Yeah. Oftentimes, it, I'm not going to say it's a tip off, but it's a strong signal that you might be looking at a game where templates would at least be helpful to start exploring. So, red let's flag, go on to basically, right? Red flag. Yeah. That's what I see all this as. That's um, really what it is. It's these are. You know, you used the word triggers before, and I think that's a great word for this. Signals works as well. Red flag, you call it what you want. It's something where it should jump out at you. Every one of these, and they're listed in our books and our courses, is something that you can say, all right, by itself, it may not get the job done, but it points me in a way where maybe I should look at it more closely. Yeah. So let's talk about what you just mentioned, which was overlaps. Okay. Let's talk about a little bit about the idea that when you have overlaps between rules and variables, and we'll explain what that means, this can often lead you to think that maybe you should explore the templating possibility idea. 
So the first one is, is if you have a variable that appears in three or more rules, I'm always going to start focusing in on the power of that variable. So it's kind of like, it's almost like a popularity contest. If you have somebody, everybody keeps telling you, oh, you have to meet this person, you have to meet this person. Sooner or later, you're going to be like, all right, I better meet this person. They, they sound like somebody important. <laughs> they keep coming up. Yeah. Yeah, they keep coming up. In logic games, when somebody's that popular, it usually means they have a degree of power. And when you have power, you push other variables around and you create limitations inside the game. So, I, you know, I often think about variables in games as people, which is ridiculous. But <laughs> I, bit. Unless I somehow, the variables are people, in which case. Yeah, off, which off is different. Hook. But I, yeah. I often visualize them. I'm often like this person, that person. So, if a variable is in three or more rules, I'm like, who is this person? They're very powerful. I want to explore them more. At the very least, I'm not just going to be like, oh, you're like all the other variables. I'm going to say to myself, let me look at you more closely and figure out if you're doing something in this game that could be extremely powerful or something that I have to watch out for. Yeah. If, if you're in that many rules, I probably do anyway, but you might be more powerful than I initially thought right. before a closer analysis. It's a good sign that that variable controls things or in your specific vision that that person's in control of a lot of stuff. And things that are in control when they occur, well, outcomes exist. That's exactly right. So another thing that we see is multiple rules that are addressing the same group or limited number of variables. And that might be that they keep overlapping the variables, not one variable, but like multiples. Like let's say you have a group like LM and R, and you have a, a rule about all three, and then you have a rule about two of those variables, and then another rule about uh, a different set of two. I'm starting to think that LM and R are a pretty powerful group. Maybe like the Mean Girls <laughs> there, in, there that, in that movie. The Plastics. <laughs> so if that's the really case, then I want to look at the that. Mean Girls. Oh. I, need to, I need to figure out if I, I should be wary of them. Probably should yes, be. is the answer. God, I did a bad Bernie Sanders impression earlier. I know Mean Girls quotes. <sighs> I'm a disappointment. I should have I should have kept that nail in the socket. You're rising in my estimation. Oh God, that's the worst thing you could say. <laughs> <laughs> Starting to be more impressed by your cultural knowledge. Well, which is usually not it's, a great. It's very narrow, um, deep but narrow. This one, I, in fact, you mentioned L M and R. I actually, I think I know the game you're referring to. Two of those three have to be selected. It was the budget committee, I think, meeting or something. Library budget reductions from '96. Jeez, uh, there you go. I'm Keep impressed with your LSAT knowledge. <laughs> uh, that's a great game. Uh, not everybody does templates on that game. That was one where I actually was on maybe the minority side and did them. I did not. I know you didn't. I've had to change the setup that you made for the courses. So, for the slides, to show both possibilities. That's fine to show both possibilities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, here's one way to do it. If you wanted to do templates, here's another. Yeah, you could. But it's a good example of where the rest of the information that came so powerful. It's like, why? Um, that's true. Yeah. I also showed the out group in that game, which is something I don't think you focus as much on. No, we actually do show that as well. It's just, I don't spend as much time with that because there are subgroups in that game. There's two yeah. out of L, M, and R, and then there's three out of a group of five variables, which is like N, S, G, N, S, W. To be split. Yeah. Yeah. Those guys. Yeah. So say when that, we've talked about it now enough. Say when that game appeared, if you remember offhand. It was 1996. It's in the Logic Games Bible. Yeah. It's also in our course as well. It's called the Library Budget Reductions Game. Which would be sufficient for Google, I think. Yeah. Um, five out of eight are selected. Yeah, it's a cool game. One of my favorites. It's also part of the reason that game's hard is because it's budget reductions, <laughs> which sounds like an out thing, but that's really the in group. Yeah. It's you're like selecting you're reduced, it to reduce. Yeah, you're in. And that feels very upside down to me. So I under... I understand the initial kind of like uncertainty and hesitation. Anyway, yeah. that kind of – that's – I wasn't specifically talking about that game, although oh. I was using those three variables. <laughs> Sorry. That's the funny thing. <laughs> it rang bells. I, was like, ah. I just looked at that game yesterday uh, with someone, and so LMNR was on my uh, – <laughs> was on my mind. But the last of the overlap ideas is if you simply have a large number of rules. So – it doesn't automatically mean anything, but think about sure. this. If you have a game with just two or three rules, it seems like that's open-ended, right? Because they're leaving it open-ended. Whereas if you have a game with seven or eight rules, 
all of a sudden there's so much happening. It seems like they're naturally limited because each rule is going to have a further effect like that. That's what a rule does. It creates yeah. a restriction. Exactly. It's a good way to say it. And so by itself, I don't say to myself, ah, seven rules. I'm going to show every possibility. But I think to myself, what kind of rules are they? Sure. And now I'm more inclined in that direction. Not many variables, but a lot of rules. Hmm. It might be that there's not too much that is yeah. capable of occurring It's here. suspicious. And then you start to combine it with other aspects. Like, again, a lot of the rules overlapping on a variable or two or addressing a small number group. And then suddenly you really do have consequences. Yeah. One of the things about this list that we're kind of going through here that's really important is – we don't look at it as a solo thing. It's not like these are each mutually exclusive and entirely independent. Right. The more of them that you have, the more likely that you're going to get a possibilities game. And it still requires the consequences to occur. But if I have like three or four of these indications, chances are getting higher and higher that the best way to approach this is to go ahead and start drawing things out. Yeah, duality with numerical distribution and overlap between rules and a bunch of rules get ready to start writing. Basically. Exactly. So you can kind of think about it as layering up. The mm -hmm. more layers you have, the more likely this is the right approach for you to use. So let's go on to something that we alluded to a few times. Sure. Blocks. Now, this is a great example. Just saying that there's a block in a game does not make me think that I need to show possibilities. However, in a lot of cases, unusual blocks, powerful blocks have a certain effect that you can turn around and determine that the best way to do this is to, to show the solutions. So let's go through these. Yeah. The first one is if you have one or more very large blocks, like maybe a block that starts off with A and then there's three spaces and then B. Block like that, I'm like, not many places that's going to be able to go. Mm -hmm. Or if you have something that's a little bit unwieldy for whatever reason, maybe it's A and B, space, space, C. I don't know. I'm, that's just an example I'm sure. tossing out there. Different blocks like that or different kind of configurations, especially in grouping games, you can get unwieldy blocks that, uh, you know, maybe span two groups. But the more blocks that you have present, the more likely that the number of solutions is going to be limited. Or the larger the block, right? Yeah. Yeah. So is, is that how you frame it, that blocks are always powerful elements, how powerful they are? Um, depends in part on how big they are and, of course, in part on the rest of the circumstances, the context. Yeah. Like when I see a block, a block in a linear game, even if it's just like A ahead of B, I know that's going to be more powerful than a regular sequence probably. And it's definitely going to be more powerful than a not block. It's Again, more fixed. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how powerful it is depends on what else is happening around it. Whether there's templates depends on what else is happening around it. But they often do produce them. That's exactly right. And depending upon what you have with the other rules, you once again have all these limitations that, that you're dealing with. So I think it's a matter of analyzing what you are looking at with the nature of how they present the block. And the game that I think is actually great for this it is Prep Test 7, which is back from the early 90s. And it's a good example of how sometimes I hear people say, oh, you know, I only did prep test 60 to the present, I'm good, but I do want to do more work. What should I do? Should I just redo these tests? No. Go back, do some of the older tests because you're going to discover that some of that stuff is going to put you in, in knots. Some of it's incredibly difficult. But this is a game uh, from Feb 93 that is about five runners being assigned to five lanes. And there's charities that are being assigned to each lane as well. So it is a double stacked advanced linear game. You got one row for the runners and you've got one row for the charities. But they have these crazy blocks that are in the middle of it that really don't fit well together. So, and they, they intermingle the two variable sets. One of the rules is that Patricia is in a lane between two of the charities and they specify the charities are F and G. In the only lane between them. In, in the only lane between them. That is going to take up three spaces. It's going to take up one of the runners, which is Patricia in the middle, and then F and G are the two charities on either side of her. Just fitting that in a, in a game with five spaces, there's only three places that block can go. Sure. It's a little more uncertain than a typical three-part block because F and G can swirl around, I believe. 
Yeah, and then they throw in another block that says there's exactly two lanes between Olivia and the lane of the runner representing Charity G. And it's like, well, that now requires its space. Either one of those blocks by itself, I would think to myself, hmm, this is kind of limiting. Mm -hmm. Both of those blocks? Now we have real problems, and that's not even the end of the rules. There's two other rules, one of which fixes a variable. At that point, there's not a whole lot that can happen, and showing the basic templates and solutions in that game makes it really easy to do it pretty quickly. So there's a couple power blocks that are really unwieldy, and trying to work them with each other is not simple at all. That makes me think there's not too much that can happen, and we're off to the races. Another great illustration, I think, of something we talked about early in this, which is a small number of variables. There's only five people in five places to put them. A block in a five-part game, linear game like that, is going to be impactful. Yeah, especially when you start tying it to other variables. Other blocks, and then you lock somebody in place, which always affects blocks. Yeah. That's a great game to do, though, to think, would I have done this in this fashion yeah. you know advanced linear games aren't always the first choice that people think about for like applying this technique this is a great example of it and if you really want to have fun do it without doing the solutions first just say i'm not going to do it just do the game as if it was a straight game it's not that it's impossible that's never the real question here it's just that it takes longer because you're drawing out these solutions as opposed to just capturing it all at first yeah I love that point. It applies so beautifully to the next thing in this, which is multiple negative blocks in one of my favorite template games of all time. Can you guess what it is? Multiple negative blocks that control the placement of things and lead to templates. I have no idea the mysteries of your mind. <laughs> it's a scary place. Uh, There's only like, <laughs> what, 360 games? Which one? Uh... <laughs> I'm thinking of... Books on a bookshelf, linguistic yeah. monographs and novels. and That game to me has three blocks, uh, not blocks really, that have to split three variables onto shelves one, two, and three. It separates the game right in half with these not blocks and lets you start making templates off of where F goes with its partner. That's the game I'm referring to. And the reason I said that was such a nice segue that you just made is try to do that game without these, without templates. That's tough. You have to recognize the way that one block works to cut across all groups, though. Um, you do. Which one block are you talking about? The F, V, W? Yeah, probably. Yeah. That creates the templates, but the game itself is split at first. And even if this was as far as you got, it really helps a lot by three not blocks with, is it VPS, I think? They can't. Yeah, there's a bunch that can't go together yeah. in that game. Uh, that game, by the way, is, uh, I don't know the prep test, but it's June 2002. Okay. It's also one of those games, uh, it's funny, I tell people sometimes, like, if your loved ones, significant others, friends and family are giving you a really hard time about how much you're studying for the LSAT, grab Game 3 from June 2002 and slide it across the table to them. That will instantly earn you, uh, I think, a couple get-out-of-jail-free cards. That game is See, brutal. It's brutal, but, you know, that's actually a nicer game. I would be like, here, take this June 2001 CD game. Okay, don't, well, that's just me. me. <laughs> that's, that's a once in forever game. Um, and there's plenty of others that are out there. There's like that <laughs> Lizards and Snakes game that I think yeah, is from the ancient. December 98 test. That's brutal. This is at least from this century. Yeah, but that's okay. I, I, if, if someone yeah. was going to hassle me about how much LSAT studying I was going to do, I'd be like, I want, I want to, I want to end that conversation. <laughs> I'm not going to be nice about it. I'm going to be like goodbye. I don't know. I see that game as a conversation stopper in a lot of ways, unless you have the templates, in which case it really lays down. Exactly. Most of these games yeah. would be conversation stoppers. There's in some terms of really hard examples that we have gone through so far. Oh yeah, and certainly made much harder if you don't have the right approach. Sure. And that's the key thing. I never think about it as you can't do the game without some of these approaches. Sometimes it's really difficult, but in many instances you could. The difference is, are you going to do it in 12 or 13 minutes, or are you going to do it in 6 or 7 minutes, or 8? Eight. You know, whatever the difference might actually be. And when I have the solutions, you tend not to miss questions. So not only did I do it faster, I did it better. And that's the real key here, is getting them right as quickly as you possibly can. It's not that you can't do it without these approaches. It's that it's harder to do it well. Yes. 
So, so I, I jumped ahead a little bit. Let's talk about what multiple blocks mean now that I've already given an example where it exists. Well, I mean, I think it's obviously – I think it's clear if we say multiple blocks. You're just talking about there's sure. each one or more rules that are introducing block relationships. In this case, you talked about negative blocks. Mm -hmm. So like the first rule might be A and B can't go together. The second rule might be C and D can't go together. And the third rule might be that F and G can't go together. When you have that, what you really have, and this is where I think about variables as people again, a bunch of people hate each other. <laughs> You're trying, to, you're trying to set up a road trip, but it turns out you've got two cars and you have all these people that don't want to hang out with each other. How do you actually arrange that grouping of people? Yeah. Well, it's made both more difficult and easier by the fact that all these pairs dislike each other. Yeah, you've got to keep them separate. I'm actually glad you picked that particular set of six variables because the game I'm referring to only had three variables in blocks, and it was all the various configurations. So in other words, there was overlap in the variables and the negative blocks I was talking about in that mm -hmm. bookshelf game. You were simply talking about A, B, C, D, F, G, or whatever it was, it was. separating. Uh, and where that's particularly impactful is when there's a small number of places to put them. Oh, yeah. yeah. Especially if, let's say, in my example, there's only two cars. Of course, yeah. Yeah, you have a situation like that. Let's say you got four spaces in each car. Well, if A and B can't go together, one of A and B is in the first car and the other of A and B is in the second car. Yeah. And now we have C and D. Guess what? One of C and D is in the first car, one of C and D is in the second car. So now I've reserved two spaces in each car for these bickering couples. <laughs> and then we have F and G. Let's personify everything. Yeah, now they are, they're going into the third space in each one. And assuming there's two other variables, guess what? Those two, they might be, you know, the best couple of them all. They love each other. They really want to be together. But nope, because they there's can't. no more room. Yeah. <laughs> they're forced apart too. This is so, a, a classic example of hurtling uncertainty. Totally. Um, which is a high-level chemistry type term, if you don't know what it means. But uh, a really beautiful instance of how you can make inferences based on the back of something that's not entirely determined. If you know yeah. that A and B have to be separate, but you're not sure where they go, you at least know spaces get filled. And your four seats are now three in each car. B and C separate, or C and D separate, whatever it was. Now there's only two seats in each car. So that, that actually happens quite a lot, especially in those binary constructions where you've only got two places to put them. Yeah, and you see it in both linear and grouping games, you although do. perhaps a bit more often in grouping. Yeah. Yeah, they use uncertainty as a space holder, and then you have to move past that space-eating aspect of these variables to make other inferences. A, a conversation, honestly, for a whole other day. Yeah, for sure. So let's move on from it. The, uh, the last thing that we'll talk about with blocks after having gone through, at least we'll just recap it really quick. So you've got one or more sizable or unwieldy blocks. Mm -hmm. You've got multiple negative blocks. And then a combination of three or more blocks or not blocks. So it doesn't matter which one that you have. If you have, say, two blocks and then another not block, that's pretty powerful by itself in terms of limiting what can actually happen. And you might notice that this conversation, I keep using the term power, in relation to causing limitations, meaning you have to account for that variable. It can't go too many places. And probably the uh, great game for that is also in the Logic Games Bible. We have it on our course too because it's such a classic. Yeah, is is the one about the seven film buffs, seeing the three films by Fellini, Hitchcock, and Kurosawa. And that is from Practice Test 27 or Prep Test 27, which is the December 98 test. And it's interesting because they set up these groups and then you have these rules in the middle of it where G and R don't see the same film, I and M don't see the same film, and then suddenly V and Y do see the same film. And as you might imagine, when you have these couples that dislike each other and then you have this other couple that's in love and they can't be separated, you have to work hard to actually account for that. So and then there's other, there's three other rules sure. in that game as well, and you some can of imagine, which that actually fix people in one of the films, which limits the spaces. Yeah, well, they make sure that one of the directors has uh, more viewers than the other, and then they fix one of them, and then they limit another variable to seeing one of two. And it's like at that point, you really limited it. Sure. 
Interestingly enough, every rule in this game touches on at least one of the ideas we've covered so far. Right? The first rule gives a numerical distribution idea. It does. The next three rules are all about blocks, two not blocks, and a regular block. By the way, I should note that block in linear means the order of things is fixed. A block in grouping means the two things go together or stay apart. Worth but while. you can use the term, I think, interchangeably. The What is that? The fifth rule fixes one of our seven variables and begins to limit the set. Not much, but down to six. And then the last rule is a split option. Every one of those is something we've actually talked about. And when you put them all together, as you said before, nicely, you really start to see consequences. Yeah. Any one of these things might make me think about it. Three, four, five, six of them, I'm like, yeah, six in uh, a row. there's a big oh, neon sign saying, hey, buddy, there's not too many things that can happen here. Maybe you should explore that. And that's really how I think about it. I mean, everybody tends to think about this as logic, formal terms. As I've said in classes before, it's not like you have to wear this white lab coat when you're doing this. You're not a technician. You need to personalize it and involve yourself. And that's often why I talk about variables as people. It's more fun and I can mock them more easily uh, when going through it. But you're right. All these rules actually pick up elements of what we've discussed already today. Mm -hmm. And I should note, too, the scenario with only three films to assign people to is a very limited number of places. So the hits keep coming. This is a really great game. None of these individually would necessarily do anything, but man, in combination, it's strong. Yeah, that's exactly the case. So that brings us to our very last point, which kind of, you know, one of the things we said before was if you have a lot of rules, that can be a limiting thing just because you're adding more and more conditions. One of the, that, that deals with the rules. On the flip side, if you look at the variables themselves, one of the things I like to look at and I, I count this almost, I think religiously would be the best way to put it, is whether or not there are randoms in a game. Like I have this thing where as soon as I've read all the rules, I'm like, were there any randoms? It's almost the first thing out of my my mouth, you know, from a silent standpoint, since I'm not talking <laughs> during the test. But I'm always like, where are, the, where are the randoms? And typically, if you have a game that has no randoms, what's that, what that is telling you is that every rule is being controlled in some fashion. Or, every, I'm sorry, every, every variable is being controlled in some fashion. And that goes right back to what we're talking about. That's restrictive. That's limited. And that's what leads to these scenarios. So by itself, if I run into a game that has no randoms, I don't think to myself, I must show all the possibilities. But I'm thinking that's just one more factor in combination with anything else that I might have seen that will suggest to me that maybe... I should explore this approach. Yeah. If limited solutions are about restricted movement, which is really what we're talking about here in the most case, then having variables that are allowed to do whatever they want, floater variables, unknowns, ones that aren't touched by any rules, that has the most possible movement of all. When you remove that element, the movement itself shrinks. And that's what you're getting at here, of course. That's exactly right. And that's actually the last of the points that we have on this kind of, I'm not going to say short list, but primary list of, of tipping point elements where we might be like, this is I don't know if it felt short to this. anybody listening, but. <laughs> I suppose not. But this is exactly, you know, uh, this is why this has been a, a nice conversation. We talked about the ridiculous chemistry stuff at the beginning. <laughs> if I were to take a chemist and make them listen to this, they'd be like, what are they talking about? Yeah. But that is the point is, if this sounds like it's all Greek, that's okay. But just realize that this level of knowledge does exist out there. And most importantly, realize you can learn it. You know, obviously, I've written books on this. You and I teach courses on this. And it is to kind of explain all this and to make it as easy as possible to understand and to absorb. But people who are doing the LSAT on a really high level are often able to see these ideas, either intuitively, which I think is very rare, or they've been taught how to do it. But you can get better at this test. And this is a great example of how you can be taught to look for certain things that will then point you in the right direction to apply high-level techniques at the right time. And it's not just logic games. This goes on in LR and reading comprehension and, and so on. So. I like it. Yeah. I I've, cannot improve on that. 
<laughs> As I once again preach for the fact that, yes, you can prepare for standardized tests, uh, a fact that I hope every listener of this podcast not only agrees with, but knows in their heart to be true. Yes. Anyone yeah. can improve on this test. Unsalably true. This test, perhaps above all, it's true because, again, you don't have to learn inorganic chemistry for the MCAT say, this is a test where once you recognize the underlying mechanisms of it, which is really what we're talking about here, if you boil it down to its molecular level, what's really going on in certain games and how can you then anticipate the best reaction? That's exactly right. You don't have to learn this whole set of vernacular nomenclature. You just have to know what to recognize in the outcomes of it. So You do, but it also actually suggests why we use some of the terminology that we do. Well, you got to call stuff something. Yeah. I can't just be like, that number thingy. Right. So I'm going to call it a numerical distribution, and hopefully once everybody gets up to speed with that terminology, they can then, you know, use it just as easily as we do. Sure. Which does bring up, uh, not really a final point, but a near final point. Sometimes people say to me, why do you put those little trademarks in the book in the course? I get this question probably once every two to three weeks. Maybe, maybe once a month. It really depends. I get it every time I teach something. So yeah, it's, it's a curiosity. It it's not and a criticism. It's a curiosity. No, no. I think it's a completely legitimate question. I'm always happy to answer it. And so just in perhaps the, the hope of forestalling future questions, <laughs> why do I do that? Yeah, right. I will tell you why. In the early days, I didn't. And all those terms that I had used got stolen. <laughs> they started showing up amazingly, in other people's courses and sometimes books. And so I thought to myself, hmm, self, maybe we don't want that to happen. And I'd prefer to have like ownership of certain things. So in the early versions of the book, I TM'd the trademark, right. uh, the little symbol. I TM'd everywhere. That was probably <laughs> overkill. <laughs> That's probably an overreaction. I was angry. You were burned, I like, man. I get it. Do not take things. Uh, and now I just put it in the very first usage, which is, uh, you know, an accepted way to do that. And somebody said to me, they're like, you've used it so many times. I'm like, it appears once in like 600 pages of the book. Was that really overkill? Well, it was distracting. I'm, I'm willing to risk the single distraction that it occurs. But that's what allows us to use some of the terminology that we do uh, and not have other people, I mean, really, to be honest, take it. So Yeah. Well, look, it's not easy to come up with perfectly encapsulating names for a lot of this stuff. And when you've got a good one, the last thing you want to do is share it. Well, it's also, it's an indication of the fact that we've been doing this for a long time. And yeah. we've been fortunate to create some things that are truly cutting edge. And you and I had this conversation recently where it's like, we were talking about some of the other people who do this. <laughs> and we're like, well, have they created anything that is an actual LSAT technique. And in some cases, there were people, and I'm like, yeah, they have. And in many other cases, by far the vast majority, I couldn't come up with anything and we didn't see anything. It was just kind of more of a, a really an academic conversation that we were having. It's an interesting it's, observation. Yeah, it's hard to do. Yeah. And you kind of have to be immersed in this and not everybody is. And part of it was, is I just really felt like it would be better to protect it. So no, that makes sense. And you, it's immersion and you have to have a certain perspective and, and ambition about it. I think uh, if you're not trying to understand this test at the level we are, if you're trying to do a cursory thing with people and I'm not going to name any companies, but there are those that I think are pretty superficial. Yeah. Well, yeah. there's things that we've done, like, you know, the justify formula is a great example yeah. of like understanding something and realizing, I mean, there's a point of pride for me. <laughs> but there are companies out there, well-known companies out there that don't even recognize that as an independent question type. Well, and, they don't realize it exists. Right. Not only is it, but we've <laughs> actually got a formula to help you solve it. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Well, I, this feels so a little self-congratulatory. I know that's not how you mean it. No, um, I don't. I mean, it's a point of pride for me. I'm like, hey, I did that. It's okay to be proud it. of the work, which is, again, why you would trademark it. I'm yeah, proud of the stuff we do, too. I wouldn't be here if I wasn't. No, and it's, part, it's a good kind of like touchstone of like, why is there this terminology? Right. We need it. It makes the conversation faster and more fluid. Do I put trademarks on everything to annoy people? No. <laughs> they annoy me, too. I wish I didn't have to. Uh, blame some bad actors in the past for that. That annoys me. Anyway, any final thoughts here now that we've talked about the, this group of triggers 
for what might make you think about showing the templates or the possibilities. I'd reiterate only one thing, and then I'm going to go brush my teeth because, ugh, Lefroy. Uh, and that is, you mentioned earlier, experiment with this stuff. Play with it. Commit in times that you shouldn't. Miss these in times that you should. Don't be afraid to try a game both ways. I'm going to do this straight out, routinely. I'm going to play with templates. Is this the point of ingress? Is that? Is this going to make the most limited outcomes? Is this other thing? The only way I think to really get good at this, once you understand what these triggers are, is to experiment and make some mistakes. Fail. That's how you learn this. At least how I did. And See it, when it, it works. Yeah, in a lot of ways, it's made me a little gun shy about it because I realize I can always do a game standard. Templates carry some risks. So I'm probably a little more template averse than some people might be. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, you, you've known this about me, I think. You've I classified know that. games as templates, and I've been like, I wouldn't. And I tend to be more template friendly. <laughs> but I'm, I, I consider myself, you know, at least in logic games, willing to take a chance on the exploration. But it's always based upon what I feel is good input data. Sure. Like I have a good analysis of it. And I also know that this is a technique that I can pull back from. I could start and then be like, mm, change my mind and continue on just as I did before. But your point right there is well taken. That idea of practicing with it. And sometimes trying it and having it fail so that you know what worked and what didn't. Yeah. A lot of times people are like, I didn't do well in that game. I only got two out of six right. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Don't think about it as you only got two out of six. Think about you just learned something about every question. Failure isn't failure until you've gone out on the test for the very last time and not gotten the score you wanted. Failure while studying is just another learning event. Yeah. It's like, what was that Edison thing? He tried 160 different types of More than of that. I, I've, all I've done is discover 2,000 ways not to make a light bulb. <laughs> yeah. He's like, I didn't fail. I just know that doesn't work. And that on his 2,000 work, first, he decided to just steal it. Was it, was it 2,000? That guy was a dick. It's something like that. <laughs> I mean, we started talking about Tesla. Now you've gone to Edison? I, know, I, I can pick a side. <laughs> Yeah, well, obviously I'm on the Nikola Tesla side. <laughs> Indeed. What? Indeed. Um, one last maybe point of emphasis, because you just talked about this idea of the value of failure, um, the insights from failure. I read a nice quote the other day. And I'll, I'll stop on this. You can keep going if you want. Where it talked about the idea of instead of looking at these kinds of things, studying for this test or having to sit down and do games or fail or experimenting with templates or any of it, instead of looking at it as like, I have to do this. I have to take a practice test today. Treat it like you get to. I thought this was a really nice sentiment. Look at it as an opportunity, as a privilege. I get to take a practice test today. I get to learn this new skill. I get to learn about templates. And I might screw it up some, but I get to get better. I get to go to law school. All of these are remarkable privileges. And that's, I think, I mean, whether you call it a life lesson or just an LSAT prep lesson, that's a really nice way to shift your perspective into a, an affirming type of pr position here. That will reward you far greater in terms of enthusiasm and motivation and resilience than feeling like this is an obligation. So, anyway, it was a sentiment I read earlier this week and it stuck with me. I thought I'd share it. I think it's an awesome one and I have nothing to add to it other than the fact that I agree 100%. So let's close out on that. Works for me. Thanks so much for listening this week. If you get a chance, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or anywhere else you find it in the world. Give us a rating if you can, and send us any questions that you might have for future uh, episodes at lsatpodcast at powerscore.com or lsat at powerscore.com. Thanks again. Have a fantastic week. We'll see you soon.